Yes. So much pressure. Your family has a long line of uh, lawyers, right? Yes, I was born into a genetic prison <laughs> uh, from which I could not escape. So that is my misfortune. Well, tell me about your, your grandparents and your dad. And there was, you my, my father was, a, my father was a, 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 a criminal lawyer or a human rights lawyer, uh, uh, as uh, you would call it nowadays, and he trained in England. Uh, he used to watch his father in court, and uh, his father was a, a criminal lawyer too. And then uh, on my grandmother's side, there are three generations going back. So I am the sixth generation lawyer since, 19, since 1828. And uh, so that's why I say I was born into a genetic prison from which I could not escape. What kind of lawyer, what kind of law did your uh, father and grandfather do? Uh, they were essentially um, criminal uh, advocates. Um, remember the professions, uh, the profession in which they grew up was quite unlike uh, the legal system you've got here, where you belong to a law firm. Mm -hmm. You do everything, but uh, in England, I mean, where their training happened, uh, the, the practitioners are divided into barristers and solicitors. And barristers are the people who have the uh, right of audience in court, and solicitors are the people who are in the office and do the paperwork on the whole. And uh, solicitors are the people who bring the cases to barristers. So they, they, they were all barristers and uh, advocates, essentially. Um, yes. Where did you grow up? I, I, I was born in Sri Lanka, and I left Sri Lanka when I was 11 to go to school in England because my family is partly, partly English and partly Sri Lankan. And uh, I then returned to Sri Lanka and then came back to England when I was 17 and um, decided to, I went into the army uh, in Britain and then I came to the bar as I always intended to come to the bar and uh, there it was and uh, so I went into the family business really, the business of uh, trying to do justice sometimes in difficult circumstances. Well, in your write-up, you do work in business crime, clubs and vice, espionage trials, extradition, human rights, kidnap and blackmail, large-scale importation of drugs, money laundering, murder, sports law, tax and VAT fraud, terrorism, treason, war crimes, and white-collar fraud. You've been prosecutor, you've been a defense attorney. Yes, because you see... <clears throat> In the UK, as indeed in Sri Lanka, I mean, the system was uh, you could prosecute and defend. Um, now, in the United States, you, if you're a prosecutor, you're a prosecutor. But uh, under the English system, many people both prosecute and defend. Uh, it is thought that it makes you a more balanced uh, advocate uh, in, in the sense that you're not wholly in the hands of the police all the time or you're not wholly in the hands of defendants mm -hmm. all the time. Uh, it enables you to take a more dispassionate view uh, uh, of And it is a system that has got great strengths. Although, currently in England, where it, 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 it's, um, it, it's almost being phased out, but, uh, and, and we are approaching uh, the, the, the sort of system uh, you have got here uh, in the United States. And many people think it's uh, it's going downhill somewhat uh, as a consequence because the uh, I mean without any criticism of uh, the system we've got in the United States, the way in which I would um, describe the position is if you were uh, a client with a problem. Uh, to express it in medical terms, if you had a medical problem, you would go and see a doctor, and your doctor would find for you an expert, a consultant, to look after your condition. 
uh, that consultant may not necessarily belong to that practice, the medical practice. Now, that's exactly what happens in England. You see, uh, if you've got a legal problem, I mean, you go to uh, a, a solicitor, and the solicitor looks at that pantheon of advocates, or that pantheon of, uh, of barristers, and finds one suitable to deal with your particular problem. Now, that is thought to be, and has been for centuries thought to be, uh, the best way of achieving things. Otherwise, you have a client walking off the street into a firm of lawyers, and the uh, client's got a problem. That firm isn't going to say, we don't have a speciality in this. You know, we're not up to dealing with this problem. They will say, oh, of course we can deal with your problem. They'll take your money, and they will do the best they can. And it may not be the best. But so the other system where, in fact, uh, uh, a solicitor or lawyer finds for the client the finest uh, uh, person with the best abilities to deal with that particular problem uh, is sometimes thought to be, and as for centuries thought to be, the preferable system. You, you have in England something uh, which is, I think, distinctive, and that is these, you were raised to the Middle Temple in 1964, yes. and then appointed Queen's Council in 1984. What, what do those terms mean? Well, uh, in England to become a barrister, that is to be able to plead before the courts, you had to belong to uh, something called an inn of court. It's rather like a, a college. And there were four of them. And the Middle Temple was one. And I joined that, and I was called to the bar as a member of the Middle Temple. And then, <clears throat> if you become distinguished in your profession, I mean, in my case, they made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, and uh, in, in 1984, I was appointed a Queen's Council, and that means that it is a recognition by the sovereign that you have achieved a, a, a degree of eminence uh, within the profession that... Um, that entitles the sovereign to visit the title of Queen's Council on you. And so th that is something that uh, ha happened to me, but with a bit of luck. There it is. Well, I don't think so. It says here, uh, you are one of the most high-profile criminal Queen's Council in all of England. You had to obviously earn that. And part of that, did you find yourself at, at some point actually having fought to Baden Suda and Hassan Jallo worked for you in a project? Well, way back, and I'm going back to 1981, and the day is burned into my mind because it was the 29th of July, 1981, when uh, there was a royal wedding in England and uh, the Queen's eldest son, Prince Charles, was getting married to his first wife. And then, <clears throat> at such a wedding, all the leaders of the Commonwealth uh, are, are, of course, invited, and the British Commonwealth, and, of course, one such country, a former British colony, was a, a country called the Gambia, which is a small country in the west coast of Africa. Now, the leader of that country was in London for this wedding, and, as often happens, uh, there was a coup d'etat, and it was a Marxist coup d'etat. And this was 1981, it was the height of the Cold War, of course, which most people have forgotten about these days. And the Gambia had a river which was, I think, 300 miles long and 100 miles deep water navigable. And the Marxists who took over that government invited the Russians in. And for 250 years, it was... Russian foreign policy to look for what they called a warm water port. And so for the first time they were presented with this warm water port on a platter by this Marxist government that had taken over, this Marxist coup d'etat had led to this government that had taken over in, in, in the Gambia. And people started getting very twitchy, particularly on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, I mean, there were some uh, 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 congressmen talking about preemptive nuclear strikes against Russia because the Atlantic routes could have been cut and so on and so forth and the Russians could have put their could have, could have, could have put several fleets 
including nuclear fleets, uh, 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 in, in, into the Gambia. And so there was a serious problem that arose. But anyway, the long and the short of the story is that the coup d'etat was put down by troops that went in from Britain and uh, other places. And in due course, I got sent out by uh, the Foreign Office in London to um, see what could be done in, 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 the pro in prosecuting those who uh, were responsible for this coup d'etat, this Marxist coup d'etat. And when I arrived in the Gambia in 1981, about October 1981, I found a thousand people in detention. And uh, the only legislation that they had in the books was an English Treason Act of 1351, <laughs> uh, which they had inherited on independence. Now, this was an act, curiously, with which I had some familiarity, not because I was alive in 1351, but uh, mm -hmm. simply because I had, uh, I had uh, uh, um, dealt with this act in other Commonwealth jurisdictions which had similarly inherited this piece of legislation. And so <clears throat> I went out and I decided that the only way in which uh, the, the, the people who sought to overthrow, overthrow the lawful government could be brought to justice for high treason was if the British government and the government of the Gambia agreed that all judges should come in from abroad and all prosecutors should come in from abroad. That was simply because it was a very small country and everybody had been touched by the um, coup d'etat and passions were running high. And so I found myself with uh, Hassan Jalla, who I'm going to see later on today. Um, he was a young man in the uh, Attorney General's department, and I was the, the Chief Special Prosecutor. And if I remember right, the current Chief Prosecutor of the ICC, she was my registrar. <laughs> wow. So we all worked together then, and this was the first internationalized court after Nuremberg in Tokyo. And people don't realize it and people don't know about it. No. But it was set up in 1981 by myself and two of the people I've just mentioned together with others. But uh, I came to the conclusion that justice could only be seen to be done if in fact the um, prosecutors all came in from outside and indeed the judges came in from outside. And that, and that was what I did. I refused to conduct any prosecutions unless those terms were met. And so those terms were met, and if I remember right, I think 40 people were prosecuted. Uh, the only penalty under the 1351 Act was death. Uh, uh, in those days, they didn't mess around. And <laughs> so, um, but I think, I think most of those convictions were, most of those sentences were commuted. I mean, I, before I left, I wrote a letter to the president saying, you know, when you look down the trail of a nation's history, you see it lit with lanterns, and the lantern of uh, humanity is the one that burns brightest. And if, in fact, you know, uh, you want to keep the peace in your country, it may be a good idea to show, uh, to show mercy, and I think he did. But otherwise, they had been sentenced to death. But uh, yes, Fatou Ben Souda, who is the, um, the chief prosecutor of the ICC, and, um, together with Hassan Jalla, assisted me in, uh, in, in, in creating and running this court, which I, you know, till the courts were set up by, the ad hoc courts were set up in 1993 by the Security Council, ICT, ICTY, and so on and so forth, it was the first court after Nuremberg in Tokyo be set up in an internationalized fashion. And so I do know something about uh, international justice and how it should be applied. It, it, was that the, you, is this was your first, was that your first introduction to that or had you had lots of experience in this whole international? I, I had appeared in a number of countries before. Right. 
Uh, but my experience simply drove me to saying I'm not going to try and prosecute people and do justice in a community that is so small where everybody in some way had been touched by the, by, by the coup d'etat and therefore everybody in one way or another had an axe to grind mm. or maybe perceived to have had an axe to grind or a motive and therefore it was my condition that I laid down that I would not prosecute unless, I would not take the job of chief prosecutor, unless uh, there was an internationalized court created, which I did. How, how did you get, where did you get the judges and the prosecutors? Where, where was the... They came from other parts of British Commonwealth. Okay. Australia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, in fact, one of the judges uh, whom I used in 1981 was one of the judges who w was on the Sierra Leone court, the special court for Sierra Leone. And so um, there it is, you see, you have this end of circle. Well, take me from 1981 when you had this special tribunal in Gambia yeah. and work your way up to Sierra Leone. Well, of course, I'd already appeared in Sierra Leone in 1968. Okay. Uh, there was a treason trial in 1968 in which I had uh, appeared, where, where there were 16 people, if I recall right, in the dock. And um, they were charged with high treason. They were the people who had formally taken independence from Britain. But there had been... They, they had lost an election, and the new government, under a man called Shias, was determined to set up a new set up a state. But in order to do so, he decided to eliminate his opponents instead of simply taking them, them to some beach and shooting them. He decided to invent a case of uh, 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 treason against them. And so you had in the dock the former attorney general, the cabinet secretary, and so on and so on. The whole, the whole panoply of uh, those who matter in government. And so there were 16 of them, and I was defending one of them. And, uh, well, the trial took, I can't remember, took about a year or so. And uh, during which I... Um, found that the foreign minister of that country was giving perjured evidence against the defense, defendants in the dark. And uh, I decided to challenge him, and I decided to challenge him vigorously, as one would a lying witness. Whereupon the Chief Justice, who was hearing the case, panicked, you see, because he said, there was a foreign minister in the dark, in the witness box, and there was I, sort of, a young, young man uh, 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 being rude, he thought, uh, to, 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 to this man to whom he owed deference. And so he told me to stop. And he said uh, that I should show respect uh, to, to, to the witness. And my reply was, I, something to this effect, that the witness should command respect and not demand it <laughs> through, through the judge. Uh, whereupon, uh, I mean, this man, the foreign minister, leant out the witness box and said, I will get you, and three days later I was arrested, I was thrown in jail. I was thrown in jail twice. They tried me on a fake charge of taking brandy into the prison when I was going to have a conference with my client. Ooh, it was a long, complicated story. But, but, but the object was to make me leave the country to run away, but I didn't. I stayed. And uh, eventually the cases against me were thrown out. I mean, there was no evidence. But the, uh, the purpose was to make my life extremely difficult. Then there was an attempt on my life uh, a few months later, because you could hear, uh, you know, I just left court and you hear the fut fut of shots hitting a wall. And, and no, nothing is more exciting than being shot at and missed. Well, that's uh, one description. And, <laughs> well, 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 there it is. 
<laughs> so uh, I, I lived through all that, and then, of course, it was a jury trial, yeah. and uh, we knew exactly what was going to happen because the government had taken such a keen interest in, in ensuring the result that the, all 16 were sentenced to death. Then the following year, I went out to do the appeal. Now, fortunately for me, the appellate court was what they call the West African Court of Appeal, not just the CLA Court, it was the West African Court of Appeal. And uh, the chairman of the court was an Englishman called Sir Philip Bridges, and then there was only one CLA Indian judge and one judge from elsewhere. And, well, I was able to overthrow the convictions, and I managed to save 16 people from execution yeah. uh, uh, at one hit. So I suppose, and I was then 28 or 29, and I suppose that was my greatest achievement. It's been downhill ever since, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, uh, and, 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 and there it is. So uh, I peaked too early. <laughs> so um, I don't think so. But at some point, the United, the Sierra Leone government, and uh, asked the United Nations yes. to create a tribunal to yes. uh, for those most responsible. Yes. Um, were you following it at the time they were actually? Advancing it to the United uh, no, States? I wasn't following it. I wasn't following it at all. I simply had a telephone call from the uh, the, the High Commissioner, the Ambassador of Sierra Leone in London, who rang me up in my chambers and said the President, uh, who was President Kaba, I would very much like you to become the Deputy Prosecutor of, of, of this new tribunal that's been created. Of course, they knew me because I'd been in Sierra Leone before, and indeed. Uh, it, 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 and, and, and so I then went out to Sierra Leone uh, to take a look as to whether or not I would get myself involved in this court. And um, I remember going to a camp in which uh, the victims of this terrible savagery were, and, and that, uh, I remember a child, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't have been more than eight, uh, with its arms cut off, uh, saying to its mother in Creole, which is a little bit like English, Mummy, when will my arms grow again? Mm -hmm. And things of that kind. And it was occurrences of that kind that actually drove me to say, right, I'm going to go back to this country and I'm going to try to bring to justice uh, the monsters who are behind uh, the sort of activity that occurred. And there is little doubt about it, the savagery was terrible, terrible, I mean, uh, you know, it was horrendous, I mean, I mean, women's having their breasts cut off, buttocks cut off, lips cut off, eyelids cut off. And they used to beg to be killed. Well, no, they were left. Uh, uh, and um, it was horrendous. It was horrendous. And one was dealing with uh, the ultimate savagery of, 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 of man on man. And uh, well, then I went out as David Crane's deputy, as the deputy prosecutor. And then in due course, I became the prosecutor. And uh, I was able to get Charles Taylor, who has just got 50 years in, uh, in the, the special court of Sierra Leone sitting at The Hague. And um, yes, I, was, I feel very proud to have played a part in bringing that man, whom I once called Africa's Hitler, uh, to justice. I mean, he, he had been the epicenter of violence all over sub-Saharan uh, Africa. He'd also been very much the acolyte of Gaddafi. He'd been, like many other of those leaders, to the Gaddafi school of terrorism in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he'd learned his business and they were terrible people. They were terrible people. 
So actually bringing him to justice gave me a great sort of sense of satisfaction. But um, there are always sort of moral issues in, 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 in international justice. You see, I mean, to bring people to justice is a very pure idea. It's, do we sometimes put purity uh, ahead of uh, uh, life? I say it for this reason. You have at the moment this terrible war going on in Syria where, where Assad has turned his guns on his own people and hundreds of thousands have been killed. Assad knows perfectly well that if he falls in power or if he goes into exile, he will be prosecuted and he will suffer the same penalties as, as, as Charles Taylor. So does that make him go on fighting? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that more people are dying as a result of international justice? In other words, is there a chance that uh, could there be a chance that some country, his friends, the Russians, for example, could say, right, you come and come into exile here, you'll be safe. And so he leaves. And then the Syria sorts itself out. But uh, he, of course, knows that were he to fall into the hands of uh, uh, the ICC, he will be faced with a trial. I don't think he's been indicted yet, but. I think there's plenty of evidence of uh, genocide and crimes against humanity against him. And he doesn't, want, he doesn't want to face that. So does international justice lead to people being killed as a result? In mm -hmm. other words, do wars go on for longer? Because people find that they have no other option than to keep fighting. I don't know. This is one of the great moral questions. I mean, I've answered it in my own mind by saying, well, uh, a part of the rule of law uh, is the concept that the law is above you. The law is above everybody. And if some people are allowed to commit terrible crimes and then go into exile, then you are in fact saying that some people are exempt from the rule of law. And the moment some people become exempt from the rule of law, that is when the rule of law comes to an end. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is my, my, my point of view. But there are many who disagree with me and say, no. If he was given a let out, he could go to Iran, or if, if Assad was given a let out, he could go to Iran, for example, and flee there with his family, and then the killing will probably stop. Now, these are the questions that, these are the moral questions that go with uh, the legal ones. That those who are lawyers in this room will uh, have to ponder in their minds in due course. Is it purity or is it life? Is it uh, justice or is it, uh, or is it peace? I mean, uh, but anyway, the, the, these are philosophical questions that people have got to answer it for themselves. You, you just blew right over the fact that you were involved and pleased to be part of. You were intimately involved in the negotiations for the arrest of Charles Taylor. Uh, for, for the students, uh, he, he had been indicted, and then he left and went to Nigeria. Nigeria. Well, he'd taken refuge in Nigeria, and the president of Nigeria basically uh, uh, took up the position that he was not going to surrender this man unless, the law, unless a lawful government in Liberia asked for his return. Of course, at that time, it didn't look as if there was going to be a government in Liberia that would ask for his return. But in due course, there was, of course, a change of government in Liberia, and somebody called Ellen Johnson Sirleaf came to power, a very fine lady who, with a background in the UN, and she did call for the return of Charles Taylor. A trial. Of course, that panicked the president of Nigeria because he was then faced with this promise that he'd given to the international community. Yes, I will surrender Charles Taylor if the lawful government of Liberia asks for him. In fact, he had no business making that condition because uh, Ch Ch Charles Taylor at that time was an uh, indicted war criminal. 
Uh, and um, the duty of uh, uh, Obasanjo, President Obasanjo, the President of Nigeria, was in fact to hand him over. However, one must remember international politics is such that the West, the United States, and so on and so forth, was very dependent on Nigeria because in all these operations that were taking place in Africa, where peacekeeping troops were needed, neither, neither the US nor Britain nor France or anybody else wanted to put their own troops in. And Nigeria was putting her troops in, in order to maintain peace in, in, in many cases. So Nigeria was acting as a regional power. In return for which, Nigeria was hoping that the Security Council if expanded, as you, as you all know, there are five permanent members of the Security Council who are the most powerful uh, countries within it. Uh, uh, Nigeria was hoping to be considered to be, or added to, this number of permanent members of the Security Council. And I took the view that if, in fact, Nigeria was giving house room to a wanted war criminal, then I would do the same as my counterpart in the Hague was doing, Carlo del Ponte, who when Serbia wanted to join the European Union, uh, Carlo del Ponte said, no, I will object to that because you have failed to surrender Mladic and Karadic and people like that who at that time were being looked for. Mm -hmm. I took up the same position with Nigeria and said, I will object. I will object to you being considered for, for, but by the Security Council. Uh, uh, because you are continuing to give house room to a, a wanted war criminal. And it was on that basis that I eventually got him. Not that Nigeria didn't join the, 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 the become a permanent member of the Security Council. I simply used it as uh, a, a threat which I thought I, could, I, I should rightly use, because no country should get into the position of being a permanent member of the Security Council uh, if such a country is willing to give house room uh, uh, to, 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 to an international criminal of this kind. Tell me about the logistics. I mean, he is housed in Nigeria. You've got to get him back to Liberia and in turn, ultimately, back to yes. Freetown. Yes. How did it all work? Well, it worked because... Uh, I mean, I find it so fascinating that you've got to move people here. Yes, well... The moment I took up that position that uh, I waited, you see, I waited till President Obasanjo was just about to come to uh, 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 Washington. He was on his way to see uh, uh, President Bush. And about 48 hours before he left to discuss two things with President Bush. And one of them was he wanted uh, President Bush to consider American support for the inclusion of Nigeria in an expanded Security Council. And he also, I think at that time, wanted American support to run for the third time as president in Nigeria. Uh, I wasn't interested whether he ran for the third time or not. But what I did say to the uh, Nigerian ambassador, I said, Mr. Ambassador, I am personally going to take up with the White House the fact that as you give house room to a war criminal, uh, 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 the White House will in fact be collaborating with your government uh, if in fact he is not returned. And, uh, and I did that 48 hours before uh, uh, Obasanjo left. And of course it had the desired result because I think I'm right in saying that uh, in Washington, I having gone public, I think I held, uh, I held uh, 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 President Obasanjo entirely responsible for handing over this man, Charles Taylor. It so happened when Obasanjo was about to leave or had left, Charles Taylor was allowed to escape mm. from, and, and that's when. Thomas Andrews' forces picked him up on the border and took up the position, the moral position, that he had breached, Charles Taylor had breached 
his promise to the, the <laughs> then Nigerian government. It's all sort of bluff and double bluff. And it's all a game, really. I mean, and 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 so so they then handed him over, and I was there to receive him. Um, I remember him being flown in um, in, a, in a helicopter, surrounded by two helicopter gunships uh, to Freetown, and I was there to receive him. But it all happened very quickly, in about 24 hours, um, simply by, my, by applying the right sort of pressure, uh, you know. And, uh, otherwise, we, we, we would never have got him, and this man would never have been brought to trial. Because, and of course, hundreds of thousands of people in Sierra Leone uh, wanted justice, and as far as they were concerned, this was the man who was behind. He was behind. He had assisted. He had uh, promoted. He had uh, 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 actively played an active part, as he was convicted of. Uh, of course, he was acquitted of certain aspects, giving direct instructions and, and things of that kind. So we must assume that judgment is correct in that regard. But he was certainly convicted of aiding and abetting the, 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 the terrible crimes that were committed in, in, in Sierra Leone. So we wouldn't have had him otherwise. And uh, it's a question of knowing when to apply pressure. And um, there it is. It's a riveting story. So he literally went from Nigeria to Liberia. Did you just turn him right around? And exactly. Because uh, President Johnson said it was terrified that he would touch down in Nigeria. And, because there was some talk about him staying the night in Nigeria, and of course he had his own, in Liberia, and of course he had his own, he had his own, um, he had his own supporters, and one never quite knew what was going to happen. So there was quite a large UN presence, armed presence, on the airfield, and I was I was talking to Liberia all the time when I realised that the plane flying him from. Uh, Nigeria was on its way to Liberia, and I was in constant contact with the commanders on the ground. Then, of course, we hit a real difficulty, because under the UN rules, he had to be handed over to... Uh, we'd sent a plane, we, we'd sent a plane uh, from uh, Freetown carrying uh, special court personnel to, to, take, to arrest him. He was being flown from Nigeria to, um, say, to, 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 to Liberia. Now, they had to have a full medical examination before they handed him over. One of the things they had to do was to, to do heart tests and all sorts of things. And I thought the time was running out because the weather was closing in. It was about 6 o'clock at night, and the weather was really getting very difficult. And I realized that uh, it's going to be very tricky, this. So I rang up the American ambassador in Freetown and said, I understand you've got a, one of these heart machines. He said, yes. And I said, I want to borrow it. <laughs> so I got through to Liberia and said, no, he's not going to have his medical. He's going to have it in Freetown here. And I've got the kit. So um, I was able to avoid that difficulty because every sort of difficulty has been put in my way. So I said, turn that plane round, he comes straight into Freetown and he'll have his medical here. And he, you know, the American ambassador said, very good, he made that, well, whatever kit it is you right, use, uh, to, to, to carry out these tests. And so there it was. So it was, it was rather lucky, it was rather lucky that uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, it, it happened in that way because the person, the UN representative, the person who represented the Secretary General at the UN, uh, who was a great personal friend of mine called Alan Doss, it just so happened on that day he wasn't there I and mean, he was in some, some other part of the world. So I had to deal with people, I could have dealt with Alan, no problem, but he just wasn't there, so I had to deal with his number two, whom I didn't really know. But anyway, we pulled it around and Charles said it was content, so it was. Uh, 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 that was. Well, we tell me what you were feeling when when he you literally he comes off the plane and now you're eyeballing a guy who was nothing but a a name on a paper for yes. And he came, he came off the plane with his uh, came off the plane with handcuffs and uh, I just made sure he was in his cell and his rights were read to him 
and uh, then I left. But uh, he was disheveled and the rest of it, as one would expect. And under the law, I had to bring him before the court um, as soon as reasonably possible so that he could face the court in Sierra Leone. And uh, those of you who have seen the photographs of Charles Taylor when outside custody, or indeed in court, uh, would realize he's a man who always dressed impeccably. And I had a message from him that he, could I please give him three days to have some clothes sent from London and Paris? Because if he was going to make an appearance in court, he intended to make a, 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 a to cut a dash. <laughs> Being the sort of chap I am, I said, of course I will. So we gave him three days grace so he could uh, uh, appear in court properly attired, you know, properly booted and spurred. So there we are. <laughs> so those are the little sort of side stories to, uh, to, 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 to this. Yes. So then, just to, just, just to complete the story, he then is appears in Freetown, appears in court, and then ultimately he is sent yes. for trial to Yes, Hague. because uh, J Johnson said if Ellen uh, had made it quite clear to me, she wasn't going to have him tried in Freetown. And uh, then I had to approach the UN and uh, to get them to pass a resolution for the trial to take place in The Hague. The Dutch weren't prepared to take him, of course, until... I got that resolution. So I had to go to New York and persuade, well, either Britain and America who were responsible for, for promoting this. And so I got through with relative ease. And so it was that he came to be tried in The Hague. Well, the other problem was, of course, where in the event of conviction, where I mean, the Dutch also said that uh, they weren't going to try him unless I could give an assurance that in the event of conviction he wouldn't have to serve his term of imprisonment in Ireland. So I then had to get, uh, I went around various countries, eventually uh, Britain agreed to take him in the event of a conviction. So all those international conditions were satisfied and then the Dutch decided to uh, uh, permit him to be tried in The Hague. So I had to jump through many sort of fiery hoops, you see, like those animals at the circus. So, uh, yes. Just so you know, this is the guy that arrested Charles Taylor. Unbelievable story. Um, you, you still, how long did you stay in the court after that? Oh, I, I was still another four or five months, and, and, and then once he was off to The Hague, I uh, took my leave of my friends and, you know, came back to London because case, that was the only case really that it was going to start and so Brenda Hollis succeeded, uh, no sorry, I was succeeded by, uh, by, by, by Stephen Rapp who's now your ambassador for war crimes and uh, he took over and then Brenda Hollis will also be here this evening uh, she took over from Stephen Rapp and actually did the prosecution of Charles mm -hmm. Taylor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to the trial, I think, on two days. Uh, in the long time it took to try him. Unconscionable time, if I might add. Uh, but then that is the fault of the judges, mm -hmm. who, uh, who didn't have a proper grip of the court. You are Sir, Sir Desmond de Silva, and you were knighted in 2007 um, I don't know that these students, and certainly I have n never had a chance to, first of all, meet somebody who's got a knighthood, let alone well, well, how it happened. Oh, it's just that, I mean, this is, well, it's I mean, the Queen just dealt with you. Well, I mean, you get a t it's a title, it becomes part of your name. So my name's got slightly extended. <laughs> so uh, that's all, I mean, you know, I don't. I don't have to put armor on or anything of that kind and <laughs> go jousting, you know, as much as I'd like to. I'm getting a bit old for it. But uh, so I do my jousting in court. Did, did, did the Queen actually, I mean, did she go? Yes, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, you've got to kneel on the... You're being too modest here. Tell, tell them about how that works. Well, I... No, I mean, I mean you've got to kneel and then, you know, uh, Her Majesty places the sword on one shoulder than the other. And uh, one hopes it doesn't slip. 
and, uh, 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 and uh, it never has. And, uh, so I comforted myself with that thought, and there it was. And that's how the that's how the that's how the process of knighthood takes place, and that's historic. It's been going on for a thousand years. So uh, there it is. Well, congratulations. Um, I was in Israel in, uh, during Christmas 2009 and then in January 2010 when, in fact, there was a lot of activity in the Gaza Strip. Yes. And I noted that uh, the, the, the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, appointed you to do some investigation on the, the flotilla and, yes. and what happened there. Can you give a little background on that? Well, on the, God, I think the 30th of May 2010, I may be wrong on the date, but uh, there were six or seven ships uh, of people traveling to Gaza. Many of you know that Israel has blockaded Gaza and uh, it's part of Israel, Israeli policy to blockade Gaza. And there has been a great international movement that this blockade is illegal. And therefore, there were six ships which contained members of parliament from Sweden and Norway and other places, and also a lot of Palestinians, on their way to Gaza. Yeah, well, a few hundred miles away from Gaza in international waters, the uh, Israeli Navy uh, uh, decided to uh, not, not just stop these ships, but to put commanders aboard. And I think they used a number of frigates, two submarines, battleships, and these were six or seven unarmed ships. Unarmed, but there, was a, sorry, there, there was a catapult found uh, on, on, on one of them. But anyway, be, be that as it may, uh, uh, I think there were 80 people who were shot, but nine fatally. And uh, the case, the, the whole issue was, the whole issue was, I mean, firstly this was a, an, a an apparent attack on shipping in neutral in, 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 in international waters, w w whether that was legal. And of course, the legality of that depended on whether the blockade was legal. If the blockade or, or, or in Gaza, on Gaza was illegal, then you can actually, in international law, stop ships even in international waters. That's, a, that's all to be established. The issue here was whether the force used was excessive in the circumstances. And if you have helicopters above sort of pouring fire onto the decks of ships where the people were on the face of it unarmed, and I had to, we had to examine the bodies, you see in the bullets, we could see the bullets had gone down to the, head, the top of the head, things of that kind. And then also some people had been shot at very close quarters because once the commanders landed, uh, I mean there were certain types of, there's a, there's a shot called a baton round, I don't know whether you use it in, in the United States, it's, it's, a, it's a bag of beans almost, you know, which you, you fire out of a, a gun to sort of hit somebody in the stomach so that you know, they, they stop doing whatever they're doing. But, I mean, one body had this in the brain, so it means that the gun had been put right up to the head and the trigger had been pulled, so I mean, such was the force it had gone straight through, through the skull into the brain. So the issue was whether the Israelis had acted uh, with an excess of force or not, and we came to the conclusion that they had on the evidence. They had, and um, yes. Yeah, so, so that report we issued to the UN know, way back in September 2010, I think. But um, 
Yes, and that, that was the matter you were asking about. I yeah. mean, you know, I got called in by the, uh, by the um, uh, United Nations uh, Human Rights Council and asked whether I'd be a party to this together with a, a former judge of the International Criminal Court and one other. And so I said yes, and so I found myself uh, in the Middle East uh, doing, this, doing this report. We've, we've taken up a lot of your time, but I've got to ask one question. Is Tell me about Jim Johnson. A, a finer man I have not met. He even picked me up from the airport yesterday. <laughs> now, uh, having put it in those light-hearted terms, I've known him for about almost 10 years, I think. Uh, he, arrived in, he arrived in Freetown, uh, where I was, and uh, throughout the time I was there, he was there. And he stayed for twice as long as I did. And it takes a very, very special sort of man to do that. It takes a man of dedication, it takes a man of guts, it takes a man of true integrity. And he discharged those functions with such immaculate concern for law and the people who uh, 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 we were all serving, that I have nothing but the utmost praise. I can't find words enough to, to, to visit upon Jim the praise I would like to crown him. Ladies and gentlemen, you, you just met an incredible individual here, in Sir Desmond De Silva. Give him a hand here. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Uh, by the way, you should probably ask, does anybody have a question that you're, you're just dying to ask? Yeah. Yes. I was curious, um, you talked about reading his rights. Um, what rights get read to, uh, got read to uh, people in a uh, special tribunal? Well, uh, <coughs> There was a set form uh, that anyone who was arrested was told that he was entitled to legal representation, that anything he did say that uh, would be taken down and things of that kind, but, I, but really informing him that uh, he would be entitled to legal representation. Now, Jim, of course, probably has got a far better idea of the, the wording than I, but it was basically to inform him that uh, he would appear before court, he'd be entitled to legal representation, and if I'm not mistaken, anything he said would only be taken down once he had legal representation. Jim, that's about right, isn't it? Yes. So, uh, yeah, so, so the rights are pretty much you know, the sort of rights that we read to a defendant here, yes, or arrested person here, yes. Um, discussions for the week, but um, what do you think about the United States' addition to Russia and China not choosing to participate in the ICC or become members of that? Well, uh, one must remember that the United States was at one stage a great uh, proponent of the ICC and uh, you know the circumstances in which the United States withdrew uh, from the ICC. Now, the ICC only has jurisdiction if, in fact, let's say an offence is committed in a particular country, that, that country fails to investigate or prosecute. Yeah. The position of the United States is, as I understand it, is this. We don't need to go that route because we will investigate and we will uh, 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 prosecute where necessary. So, so, I mean, that is the position of the United States, perfectly uh, entitled to take up that position. The opponents of that position will say, well, of course you're, you won't agree to the Rome Statute because you intend to cr commit more crimes yourself. And that's why you don't agree to, to, to make yourself party to uh, the, the, the ICC because you intend to commit these crimes yourself. So if you have these two different schools of thought, 
So you've got to make up your mind which is the right one. So, um, yes, any other questions? Um, you, it seems like you've been a lawyer in a lot of different countries. Where exactly have you had cases? Oh, uh, of course, I'm in the UK, obviously. Right. Uh, I've appeared in Gibraltar. I've appeared in Kenya. I've appeared in Tanzania. I've appeared in the Bahamas. Appeared in the Gambia. I have appeared. I can't think of that. I mean, I don't know. I can't arrive at that. But the interesting thing is, I've I've become a member of the bar of uh, all these countries, and so uh, I think next year I'd be at the bar fifty years. So it's uh, so it all comes from living a long time. You see, you must keep up the habit of breathing. That's that's the answer. That's the answer. Yeah, yes, and, and and dodging the bullets. Yes. Are you doing a memoir? Uh, yes, but you see, you do, you do. I mean, you do your memoirs when you feel you've finished. I haven't quite finished. <laughs> uh, I, I I I I can't settle down to, uh, to, to 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 write my memoirs yet. I feel there's a lot of unfinished business to. Perhaps I might, if I got the time. This is so great that you, you're back. Welcome back to the Jackson Center. Well, it, it, this is a historic place, and I, 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 I'm so pleased that you played such an important part in ensuring that this remains a shrine to Justice Jackson, who deserves all the credit uh, uh, one can possibly give him. He was a seminal figure, and Nuremberg and all international justice nowadays goes back to Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. So you're, by your reviving and keeping alive uh, his memory in this house in which he lived, surrounded by the artifacts of his, of his time and the possessions, some of the possessions that he had, you're playing a remarkable role in, 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 in actually inspiring young men and women like you've got in this room to take to the law and apply its finer principles because ultimately without uh, without law there is no justice mm -hmm. and without justice there isn't a world worth living in really. So those of you who do law are playing a very important part in the future of mankind. And this house has played its own part with regard to man's future and has brought into being, through Justice Jackson and everything that happened in Nuremberg, the importance of the rule of international law. Man, with that we better stop. <laughs>